Not too often does a lead singer of a rock band get to sit down with a Bible translator, but it happened. Eugene Peterson, the translator of the Message Bible, didn't even know who YouTube or Bono was until he got a copy of Rolling Stone magazine. The magazine included an interview with Bono, which was just the beginning of Eugene getting to know him. Watch to find out how this unlikely friendship took place. And also, if you have not yet visited Israel, it is a beautiful place to visit. As a matter of fact, you go to Tel Aviv, reportedly one million people travel to Tel Aviv every single year. It's a large city. You know, Avi Mizraki, who do give ministries, is sharing the love of Jesus Christ with those in Tel Aviv, one cup of coffee at a time. Check it out. Be sure to subscribe and press alert to get new notifications of new success secrets made available on VFN TV. Right now, we're going to do transition uh, real quickly into an incredible story about uh, Bono and Eugene Peterson. Bono is uh, the lead singer for U2, a, 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 a man, a rock band that's been mm -hmm. around for a very, very long time, very successful. And uh, Bono came across uh, Eugene Peterson's translation of the Bible. It's called The Message. You, you may have read it before, been aware of it. It, it, it translates the Bible into a more modern English and uh, uh, Bono's been known to, to really just talk so much about the Message Bible. He, just, he really enjoys it. And they came together, this Bible translator and this this rock musician, uh, come together to do a documentary on the book of Psalms. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you wouldn't imagine these two coming together. Mm -hmm. you, watch this. Mr. Peterson, uh, Eugene, um, my name is Bono. I'm the singer with uh, the group U2 and wanted to sort of video message you my thanks and our thanks and the band for this remarkable work you've done. There's been some great translations, some very literary translations, but no translation that I've read that um, speaks to me in my own language. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, take a rest now, won't you? Bye. I never heard of Bono before. And then uh, one of my students um, showed up in class with a copy of the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones? And in it, there was an interview with Bono in which he talked about me and the message and he used in some you know slangy language about who I was and uh, and I said who's Bono and they, they were dumbfounded I never heard of Bono <laughs> but that's not the circle that I really travel in very much so that's how I first heard about him And then people started bringing me his music, and I listened to his music, and I thought, I like this guy. And I, I was starting to, after a while, I started was start being quite pleased that he knew me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but the rest of the story is when the, he invited you to come and hang with them for a while, you turned him down. I was, I was pushing a deadline on the message. Uh, was finishing up the Old Testament at the time, and I really couldn't do it. I, I, uh, you may be the only person alive <laughs> who would turn down the opportunity just to make a deadline. I mean, come on. <laughs> it's, it's Bono, for crying out loud. Dean, it was Isaiah. Yeah. <laughs> the Old Testament is a long, long book, much longer than the New Testament. And it did take a long time and a lot of devotion uh, on both of our parts to ha have that happen. I have to 
say, in the last years, Eugene's writing has kept me a sane as, as this is, if you call it sane, which you probably won't, uh, Run With The Horses. That's powerful manual for me and it includes a lot of incendiary ideas you know I, I hadn't really thought of of Jeremiah as a performance artist why do we need art why do we need the lyric poetry of the Psalms why do we need art? because the only way we can approach God is if we're honest through metaphor through symbol so art becomes essential, not decorative. I learned about art. I learned about the prophets. I learned about Jeremiah with that book, and that really changed me. And then uh, several years later, this was about four years ago, four or five years ago, Bonner would like me to come to Dallas to uh, my Jan and me to come to. Dallas and for a concert. We saw, we went to the concert. He was very um, sensitive to us. It was, we were really well cared for, had really good seats. And uh, I'd never seen a mash pit before. That was my introduction to the mash pit. <laughs> Is it a pit? It's a mosh pit. Mosh pit. <laughs> okay. Uh, you can see how uneducated I am in this world. And we had a, it was a three hour lunch. And uh, we just had a lovely conversation. Uh, it was just very personal, relational. He didn't put me on any kind of a pedestal, and I didn't him. So we were very natural with each other. But I was just, uh, through that three-hour conversation, I was just really taken by the simplicity of his life, of, his, of who he was, who he is. And uh, there was no um, pretension to him. And uh, so I, at that point, I just, you know, felt like it was, he was a companion in the faith. I want to invite you to VFN Dream Center Church. Listen, we love family. We are focused about, around reaching the world. But most of all, we just want to be able to honor God and connect with people who want to honor God. Are you looking for a family? Are you looking for a church family? You're looking to be a part of somebody who understands the great commission is first to reach the world. Well, we're doing it, and maybe you're supposed to be a part of it. As a matter of fact, you can join us this Sunday at 10.30 a.m., actually 10.15 a.m., at 6500 Pensacola Boulevard in Pensacola, Florida. You can even join us online at vinefellowshipnetwork.org. Listen, we're reaching the world together with the VFN Dream Center Church. We'd love to have you. In 1943 America, Dennis Day was singing, I'll be home for Christmas. In Germany, 800 prisoners of the Third Reich were awaiting trial in a military prison. Lutheran pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer was among them, hoping to be released by Christmas. That didn't happen. In December 1943, Bonhoeffer wrote a Christmas letter from his prison cell. He wrote that it could be easy to despair, but that this Christmas would be more meaningful to those in such a lonely and desolate place. He wrote that Jesus was born in a stable because there was no room for him in the inn. A prisoner grasps this better than others. After being moved from one prison and concentration camp to another, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was executed in April 1945 engage with the Bible in words of hope in perilous times. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible. 
Welcome back to VFN TV with your host, Greg Lancaster. Bono and Eugene wow. Peterson, absolutely amazing. And this is a, what, you know, VFN KB is all about. Kingdom, you know, it, it, listen. We're supposed to influence all the mountains, mm -hmm. right? All the mountains of culture. And this is the, you know, arts and entertainment. Here you have a, a lead singer of one of the, you know, legend, legendary, you know, biggest rock bands, you know, in the world, hanging out with a Bible translator. How awesome is that? And he's connecting with yeah. God. He writes a song, you know, about the book, uh, Psalm 40. And it's just amazing. I mean, this we're supposed to do influence society like this because there's something in the creative, there's something in, in, in our heart that that really longs for God, even if when we don't know God. And then when we run into God, we go, I've been looking for you. And he says, No, I've been looking for you. Mm. And 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 we meet. I want you to to watch uh, uh, uh Eugene Peterson, the Bible translator of the Message Bible, and and Bono actually have a conversation over a kitchen table about the book of Psalms and about King David and, and, and how raw, uh, you know, David was in, in, in the writings, what, what he was led to, 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 to pen out by the, you know, unction of the Holy Spirit. It's amazing because you're, you're seeing this interaction take place. Watch this. <laughs> now look at this. It's yeah. so good to have you here. Great to see you. Oh, God bless you. Well, God's blessed you, that's for sure. <laughs> Look where you live! <laughs> this is quite a spot. You know, I just realized, never been to Montana. Haven't you really? So, many gifts already. <laughs> just, just, just since being here. And welcome to the Flathead. That's what I always like to say to people when they come. What is your earliest memory of the Psalms? And what sort of impression did it have on you both? I was 12 years old when I discovered the Psalms. I picked up the Bible and I started reading. And somebody had told me that the Psalms were important. So I started with the Psalms and I was totally confused. Because um, I grew up in a culture where every word in the Bible was the word of God, literally. Don't mess around with it. It's just, that's the way it is. And I was starting to read uh, that he keeps my tears in this bottle, uh, shields, <laughs> uh, javelins, uh, rock. God is a rock. Come on. And um, after about two or three weeks of this, I just was just confused. And I thought, I'm missing something. And... Uh, I'd never heard the word metaphor before, but I learned what a metaphor was, not by knowing the name, but by just observing what's going on in the Psalms. So I think the Psalms are important because they, for some people like me at 12 years old, they showed me that imagination was, um, was a way to get inside the truth. I remember the Psalms from the little Church of Ireland church um, um, so as a child going, I remember thinking, great words, shame about the tunes. Uh, <laughs> except for The Lord is My Shepherd, which was a great tune. And I really like that. This is good. Words and melodies. Ah! They have this rawness, the brutal honesty of whether it's David or not, it doesn't matter. The psalmist is brutally honest about the explosive joy um, that he's feeling and the deep sorrow or confusion. And it's that that makes, that sets the psalms apart for me. And, and I often think, gosh, well, why isn't church music more like that? The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not one. He makes me down to lie in pastures green. 
He leadeth me the quiet waters by. Is that right? It's beautiful. It was right. Powerful. Mm. I mean, absolutely powerful. And this is what the Bible does. I mean, when 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 man can get the word of God mm. in a language that they can understand, the word of God transforms your heart. It doesn't matter who you are, if you're, you know, somebody that no one knows, or you're a international rock superstar. Listen, when God speaks to your heart, he speaks to your heart. That's right. And he got Bono, Bono hanging out with Eugene Peterson, <laughs> you know, singing the Psalms. This is just too cool. But just the beginning of, of what happens when you go after God and you fulfill your destiny and your purpose, listen, other people get blessed. Mm. And I thank God for, for Eugene Peterson because yeah. he wasn't doing what he was doing. Bono wouldn't be touched right. and be influenced the people that he's influencing today. We'll be right back. The world's waiting for a hope. They're waiting for another conversation that only you and your assignment can provide. Daniel was just faithful to his assignment and he kept getting called before the kings. They remembered him from generation to generation and said, wait, there's one man who can solve this problem. And I believe that God's releasing people into their assignment. And in their assignment, there's going to be people who hear the whisper of their name. And they're going to, you're going to find yourself called into places. Maybe you're just a barista. And all of a sudden, the head of the whole coffee company comes in and goes, I need to talk to you. I've heard some things that you've done here. And you're like, am I in trouble? No, it's actually the opposite. We're in trouble. We need you right now. I'm hearing these scenarios all over the world right now where Christians are being placed to solve problems and to, to cure confusion. And it's not just in one genre or area. The beautiful thing about the kingdom is it works in all aspects of life. It's not just like the easy parts of life. It's the hard parts of life. That's when Christianity shines. That's when we're a light is the hard parts of life. There's two options and all of a sudden we bring another option. There's no answers. Everything's exhausted and all of a sudden we show up and it's like because we showed up, like when Jesus showed up, another option's presented and people are like, how is God this good? Did you know that Jesus himself said, apart from abiding in him, that we can accomplish nothing? So many people want to be able to do that, but you know what? They don't have a plan to do it. We put together a simple plan for you, and it's at iabide.org. It's iabide.org. Go there and request your plan today. It is amazing how your life will change when you begin to spend time with him who created the universe. He's been desiring that you would do that. It's at iabide.org. Request your simple plan today. Bob Crostarosa, who is a senior vice president of marketing in the Juno Beach, said, John, talk about execution. Well, we all know the person who says, ready, aim, 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 aim. Hey, pull the trigger. Do something. Execution means that you do more than think. You do more than plan. You take the plans that you've thought of and you initiate. You get it started. The greatest gap between the successful and unsuccessful people is the gap between knowing and doing. A lot of people know what to do, they just don't do it. You know, the old Nike thing, just do it. Here's what I've discovered. People that just do it are a lot more successful than people who think about doing it. I've never made any money on an idea that I thought that I didn't implement. I've never made a difference in a person's life of who I thought maybe I should encourage, but I decided not to encourage them. It's always the execution of the plan that brings the fruitfulness for the plan. So no more ready, aim, 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 aim. It's ready, aim, fire. Execute. It's the first step to fruitfulness in your life. Welcome back to VFN TV with your host, Greg Lancaster. We want to also bring you some hope. We want to bring you some encouragement as we know many of our viewers stand and love uh, Israel, stand for Israel. Uh, you know, we've mentioned to you before about a, a friend, a ministry friend of ours, Avi Mizrahi. 
Uh, he has a uh, Messianic outreach, a do-get ministry in the heart of Tel Aviv. And um, he sends his greetings. He sends uh, his love. He asks us to share with you to continue to pray for Israel, continue to pray for their ministry. Uh, they were used by God to pray during this time to mm -hmm. intercede. And um, thank the Lord for that. We want to just bring you an update on their ministry so you can kind of see, get a heart and a feel for what they do in Tel Aviv. Watch this. Avi Mizrahi, and um, uh, we live here in Tel Aviv, Israel, and uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful city. What's exciting is to see what God is doing. Uh, since uh, I uh, became a believer, I accepted the Lord Yeshua into my heart, uh, went to Bible school, I just knew that I want to do one thing. I want to come back to my home city and preach the gospel and make disciples. And that's how we started and I started going to the streets of Tel Aviv, preaching the gospel, sharing the good news that the Messiah is risen and is alive. And as people responded to the gospel, then uh, the Lord spoke to me to do a discipleship group. So I started doing a small Bible study of six, seven people, and uh, this home group became a congregation. And that's how we started uh, Adonai Rui Congregation, The Lord is My Shepherd. It's a Hebrew-speaking, Israeli, a local congregation where people start coming to worship on Saturday and we've grown from a small group of six, seven people to 150 people, including children. And it's wonderful to see that indeed uh, Jewish people today are responding to the good news and coming to know Yeshua as their Savior, as their Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. We live in a very exciting time. And then somebody said, we should open a distribution center and feed the poor and the needy. We looked for a place and we rented a, a, a place and we opened our distribution center. And today we, uh, we feed about uh, between 80 to 100 families every month. That, and we work with the municipality of Tel Aviv to the social affairs and, and they send us families uh, like Russian immigrants, single mothers, poor people, and we give them bags of food and clothes. And many, many times we had the opportunity as we do that, they, they feel the love and the, and the welcoming and they ask, why? Why do that? And we share the gospel, we give them a Bible. And then uh, we open this uh, Dugit, uh, uh, this Dugit uh, Messianic Evangelistic Center, which is uh, a coffee house ministry. Dugit means a small fishing boat. We are fishes of men in the heart of Tel Aviv. And we go to the streets, share the gospel with teams, with music, and then invite people for a free cup of coffee and uh, we have music, live music and people are very, very open in Tel Aviv. Uh, Tel Aviv is a secular city, people are very open, they want to know uh, what do we believe and we are able to present the gospel and share the truth. And as we do that, we see the harvest is ready, we see people are opening up, they want to know more and when they come to know Yeshua, when Jesus comes, He touches them, He changes their life. About uh, a year ago or so, I was invited to Korea to speak on a conference with another pastor about Israel and we were a few days there. And, uh, and when I was there, the Lord really uh, spoke to me that what we need is a breakthrough for our city, Tel Aviv. And uh, uh, the Lord really has put in my heart that uh, I need to go and look for a place and build him an altar, find a place and build an altar of prayer and worship for breakthrough for this city, Tel Aviv, Jaffa. And, uh, and as, so, as soon as I came back, I looked for months and months, looked at different places, 
And God led me to this building and were able to renovate it and dedicate it a year ago. This room is a house of prayer, a prayer tower on the top on the 12th floor that overlooks the whole city of Tel Aviv. And we worship and pray together and we have now different night watches and different people who come to pray specifically for the salvation of the Israelis, specifically here at Tel Aviv, Yafo. So we, we really praise the Lord for every opportunity that God gives us, either to the distribution center of the food and the needy, or the Dugit Outreach Coffee Shop Ministry, uh, that we can be right here in, in downtown, in the heart of Tel Aviv, uh, sharing the gospel and bring people into the kingdom of God. I believe this is the harvest time. This is harvest time, and we need more than ever for people to pray for us, for laborers, and for people to stand with us in such a time as this. In the midst of tragedy, we want to encourage you of all the great work that's being done in the heart of Tel Aviv. Mm. Listen, it's, this, it's happening. This is now. Be encouraged. Continue to pray. Pray for Avi and pray for Israel. Pray for the Jews, not just in Israel, but all over the world. Be sure to subscribe and press alert to get new notifications of new success secrets made available on VFN TV. You know, a lot of people want to abide with the Lord, but they just don't have a plan to do it. You can request that plan today at iabide.org. I'm your host, Greg Lancaster, and we're so glad that you've joined us. Don't forget you can join us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Download our app and sign up for our newsletter, The Torch, at vfnkb.com. I've enjoyed our time together. God bless.